everybody, Zane Banks here, and I want to talk today about improving your blues soloing. So a lot of people get fixated on playing licks or patterns or technical things, or they want to focus on scales. And at the end of the day, when it comes to playing blues, it just isn't about that. It really is about telling a story through a melody. And fortunately, you know, we've got the blues scale or pentatonic scales that we can work with that makes it easy. You know, it's not like we have to learn a bunch of scales to do it. But at the end of the day, you have to just play a good melody based on strong phrasing, good note choice, lots of use of motifs. And that's the thing that will really see sink or swim to the quality of your solo. When we look at our favorite blues guitar players, B.B. King, Eric Clapton, Derek Trucks, Stevie Ray Vaughan, the list goes on and on. That is what they are doing. And there are a couple of different things you can do in order to improve this. I think that a lot of guitar players don't really listen to what it is they're playing and they don't really think about what it is they want to play. I think their fingers kind of make the decision for them. And that's never really the strongest option. Uh, it's, as you know, there is no individual mind in each finger. And so what happens if you don't make an executive decision up here about the notes that you want to play is that your hands just fall into the habit of playing the notes in the boxes that they're familiar with. Your eyes kind of sight those boxes. I think we're too reliant on our eyes as guitar players. And as a result, we just have these insipid melodies that you hear a lot of the time. They're not bad, like they're not dissonant, they're not out of tune, but they're also just not that convincing. You know, it's like the difference between a really well written story or a novel and one that you can't fault for its spelling and its grammar, but the narrative's just pretty average. I think one of the best things that you can do is to sing what you play. When you sing what you play, you're forced to have to think about what it is you actually want to play. And it links your ear with your mind, and then you have these foot soldiers attached to the end of your hands that just do the job for you. So I've got a feeling my guitar is... No, I'm still in tune, that's all good. So what I suggest you do is get comfortable with singing the blues scale. You want to hear each degree of the scale, and you want to get familiar with what those notes sound like. They all have a quality. So if we're in the key of G, for example, the tonic G sounds really stable, okay? It's perhaps not the most interesting note you could play, but it's got an incredible gravitational pull that everything in blues is going to eventually want to come back down to the tonic. And you hear guys like B.B. King ride the tonic like for entire choruses. That sounds great. The next note that we get, if I'm talking about minor blues here, is the flat third degree. Now, this is the one that has a dark quality to it. It's minor. You know, it sounds kind of sad. You can pull on it slightly and imply a major third. That's a really beautiful thing to do. But if you just play the note by itself, unaffected by a bend or vibrato, it sounds kind of sad. The next note after that is the fourth. Now, the fourth, in classical music, a fourth is considered a dissonant. And the reason why a fourth is considered a dissonant is because it's unstable. It is essentially a suspension, hence sus4. And so a fourth then wants to resolve down to the third, either major or minor. But it's a great note that we can use because you can play with that tension. I think most people who've grown up listening to Western tonal music are familiar with these rules. It's like, you know, you, a lot of people can't necessarily explain how grammar and syntax and linguistics works, but they can speak English fluently or whatever language it is they're speaking. And music is the same. We can just kind of hear, like, if you're in G, that doesn't sound resolved. Now it sounds resolved. So you can play with expectation on that fourth. It's a very useful interval. The next one, if we're going to play a blues scale, not a pentatonic scale, is the raised four or the flat fifth. This is known as the blues note or the tritone. It's the note that in the Middle Ages was banned, known as Diablos in Musica, because it's so dissonant. And without that note, we wouldn't have basically rock and roll, certainly not heavy metal. 
It is extremely dissonant. You can't linger on this note. Well, I wouldn't advise you linger on this note, but it's fantastic as an embellishment. It's, I mean, you know. And you get different qualities going from the flat five up to the five. Or going from the four. It's particularly good when you go from the four up to the flat five back to the four. Very strong. Then we have the fifth. Okay, the fifth degree is very, very strong. Again, not that interesting. And it's like the tonic and the fifth are like these big fortresses that there's not a lot of color in them, but they're very stable. You can use the flat five, of course, as I just said, to embellish that. Then the final note we get in our hexatonic scale, because there are six notes in the blue scale, is the seventh, the flat seventh. Now this flat seventh is also loaded with tension in much the same way as the fourth, because it wants to go up to the tonic again. So if you can sing those like and you can just hear in, you know, in your ear's eye or your mind's eye, however you want to put that, what each sort of chord tone or character to the note there is, then you can start to compose melodies. And it's also great if you learn a solo. Let's say, for example, you learn a Stevie Ray Vaughan lick. You know, I'm just going to make one up now. Something like this. Learn that, and then look at what the notes he's playing. It starts on the fourth, he bends up to the fifth. So what I was saying about suspension, fourth isn't stable. Then he plays another fifth, because he's bending a unison. And then he goes to the tonic. Ooh. And then he bends from the flat seven up to the tonic again, like what I was explaining. So then try and sing that, and then try and sing it away from the guitar. It's interesting. When we sing things naturally, we just, without even thinking about it, put phrasing, we put dynamics, we put articulation. It sounds musical. When someone sings something, it just inherently sounds musical. But then when we try and play to something on the guitar, unless you've trained that, it often sounds divorced of a lot of musical things. It just sounds like notes. And that's why if you, if you lead with what you sing, then I think your fingers and the physical aspect of what you're doing musically, which is playing the guitar, will follow suit. So I would suggest singing those licks. You know, I used to, and I still do this, if I'm walking to the bus stop or if I'm driving a car, I'll just sing lines to myself. And it forces me to have to phrase. You know, guitar players, because we're not based on breath, like the flute or the trumpet, we sometimes tend to play too often. And in the same way that no one wants to be stuck at a party with someone who's just yapping away without a break, it's just too much to process, no one wants to listen to a musician who does that. So, you know, if you analyse the pauses and the sentence length of what I'm saying to you now... That's kind of a, a pretty good model, and not that I'm doing anything special, I'm just talking, but it's a pretty good model for what you want to try and do when you're improvising. It should be conversational, you know? I mean, for me, one of the greatest guitar players out there, the guy who sounds the most like a human voice is Jeff Beck, and he just has this down to a T. But when we have to sing what we're playing, if you are really strict about it as an exercise, then it means you have to take a breath, so therefore you have to stop. So therefore you are just naturally phrasing. It's as simple as that. There's nothing intellectual about it. You don't have to try too hard. Just only play what you can sing. So you might try and you know put up a backing track. And initially you might find it a bit kind of tricky to do this because you might not be able to hear those notes. So just keep it local. Maybe start on the tonic, go into the third and the fourth. See how I naturally did some vibrato with my voice? So then, I added after about a beat and a half. There's nothing wrong with what I played there. It's not virtuosic, it doesn't have to be. It's just a strong, motific idea that has nice shaping and nice musicality and it isn't rocket science. And you can extrapolate that idea and put it to different parts of the fretboard.
remember, you want to tell a story in your solo and you don't want to tell your life story. I think limiting a solo to two choruses as a general rule is a pretty good thing. A lot of great improvisers didn't play that long. If you listen to a lot of Charlie Parker solos, he just does one chorus. It's fantastic. It leaves you wanting more. So I would suggest as part of your practice, sing up and down the scales, play with yourself on the guitar, and then maybe just try and sing it so that you're training your ear. Play along with backing tracks and only sing, what, or only play what it is you can sing, I should say. And you don't have to do that live, although some people do. You know, George Benson has made that a bit of his sort of uh, shtick, you know, singing what he plays. But when I'm playing live and I'm doing a solo, that's what's happening in my head. I'm singing what I'm playing internally. And sometimes I, I do actually sing. I'm just off mic, so you can't really hear me. But that's what helps build a solo. I'll talk a little bit more about building a good blues solo. Do a video on structuring and, and exercises you can do to sort of, you know, if we're talking about that narrative, you know, bring in a bit of drama and, you know, resolve things. But in terms of good, strong note choice, phrasing, musicality, articulation, singing what you play is invaluable. And it's not hard to do. So just start doing it now. Next time you sit down with the guitar, if you can't sing it, don't play it. So please give us a follow here on YouTube. You can hit the bell so you get a notification about the video that I put up next. I do about two a week. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the Reverend Dr. Z and you can find me on Facebook, my artist page, Zane Banks. And we've got a bit of a forum going there so you can discuss gear, music, you name it. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any suggestions about videos that you would like me to do on any aspect of music, guitar playing, technique, you name it, send them through. I'd love to hear from you. Take it easy and have fun picking.